fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Well, Austin, you've been writing some books. Um, what? How did you get into the uh, profession of writing? Well, it's it's kind of funny you ask because in theory, that's why I went to college. Uh, you know, the great creative writing, uh, English degree, blah, blah, blah. And, and of course I work in, you know, my, my regular day job is actually software uh, specific to retail, which is completely along the lines of my degree. So, uh, you know, fast forward many, many years. Um, this book actually came about because I was living in downtown San Diego and the, the building that really inspired it all uh, was loomed over my daily life. And I, I always thought to myself, if they ever renovate that, what are they going to find? And then that just sort of cogitated in my head for about, um, you know, a, a real decade before it was a fully formed story. Uh, and then I was able to write it relatively quickly. But the funny thing about publishing it, which is completely different than, of course, writing, uh, was that I got involved with uh, some other writers, and through just a, a weird series of, you know, emails and, and um, friendly banter, I wound up uh, beta reading and editing for a couple of authors. They did the same for me, and you know, really pushed me into publishing it. Um, and there you go. I now have uh, another one in the works. The audiobook is in production, almost finished. And then the third one uh, is outlined. So, um, you know, many, many years after uh, being educated to do this, I guess I'm finally going to do this. <laughs> wow. So when you're doing this, when, where, how did the confidence come then? Because you didn't, you didn't jump into it. You took years and you were doing other things. So, you know, it's, it's something to write your story, but to actually decide – um, well, I'm going to publish it, or I'm going to go further with it, and and then do more. Um, where do you think that confidence come from? Uh, and, and it's interesting you use the word confidence. It is, in fact, my self doubt that really drove me to do it. The whole, um, you know, can I actually do this? Can I actually do this? I don't think I can do this. And then reading a couple of books it, within my specific, you know, niche within a genre that were terrible, <laughs> that were just, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I hate to, to say that, but um, one of the things, and the worst part is this, it's not that they're badly written books, you know, great characters, great plot, wonderful prose, but the relationships between the characters were so artificial. Mm. Um, it, it felt like I was reading a, a straight Harlequin book from the 70s that even today would be uh, like, oh, that's just too <laughs> artificial, you know, these, these two-dimensional, if you want to say, you know, gender roles, things like that, that were just terrible. Mm. Like, okay, clearly the people writing what is arguably a gay mystery have never met a gay person or a mystery in their life. So um, there you yeah, go. Th that, but that leads, to a, <laughs> that leads to a lot of questions there, because when you say when they're writing a gay mystery and they've never met a gay person before in their life, th so do you have a... Oh, do you have kind of an, an issue with people that are not something that are writing about something? Do you know, I mean, as so, since, you know, like if, if you're saying, okay, well, I'm gay and I can write about being gay or if I'm, you know, whatever I am, um, do right. I have to be right, that right. person? Yeah. Do you have to be? No. Do you have to be aware that you're not that person and really educate yourself? Absolutely. I would never write a book about French pirates because I'm not French, I'm not a pirate, and I haven't done the research to feel comfortable speaking like a French pirate. Um, 
there are some authors that are totally capable of this that are not gay men. Um, on the other hand, the vast majority of the mainstream, and if you want to call it M slash M, because that's it, it's different than gay mystery in, in my opinion, but that that's the bulk of what's out there. Um, many of them are straight women writing, and and that's fine, you know, to be completely honest. But then portraying themselves as gay men writing, that's not fine. Mm, that's yeah. Not yeah, but and you know. You wind up, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I, I was just going to say, how can you? I, I I don't know how you can really. Um, it's a really tough time right now because we're in such a a council sort of culture, right? Fair enough. And so, um, uh, you know what I mean? Like, where do we, where do we draw that line? I we've interviewed plenty of of females that write as males and they write gay usually romance books, it seems like, mm -hmm. more than fiction. Um, and I've heard a lot of people complain about it, you know, from from doing interviews. And I'm, it's mm -hmm. sort of, I just, I I don't know. You see, the problem with me is I don't read them, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, that, that's, I guess, a, a key to it. Um, one makes the assumption that if you're writing this, you are first reading it. Um, and maybe there's a different expectation um, you know, I don't really read books for, if I'm going to read a romance, I'm going to read a romance. I primarily read mystery. Uh, it's the puzzle that interests me. And I, I don't happen to care whether I'm reading a, a gay, straight, transgender, whatever the, the mystery happens to be. I, I'm, I'm curious about the plot, the puzzle, the getting there. Everything else, you know, um, and I guess if you think of it this way, if you grew up watching, um, you know, mainstream TV in the 80s, like I did, <laughs> you're watching Heart to Heart. You're watching Remington Steel. Uh, you're watching these, even things, you know, more like uh, fantasy shows like Fantasy Island. There is a, uh, a payoff at the end. You're watching it just to get to the answer to the puzzle. Now, along the way, if you identify with the characters, that's, even better if you identify with the surrounding the settings that's you know it all adds to the completed thing so if i'm reading a mystery novel and there are characters identified as gay men that happen to have a relationship if you every single time you put these out there one is a big hulking masculine stupid one who's always the top <laughs> <laughs> and, then, or, and then the, the smart, funny, crass, physically um, smaller or less capable one who's always the bottom. Come on. That's yeah. not real. And it's boring. It's just horribly boring. Yeah. So, and you find that this, prim of... this, this primarily comes from authors that aren't gay or in or of that world. Or These just tropes. aren't. Yeah, that seems, to, yes. I'll just go ahead and be blunt. Yep. That's yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I'm Jewish and I love Quentin Tarantino. I'm a fan of all his movies. The only one I can't stand is Inglorious Bastards. And I have mm. different problems with it, but I got at some level, whether it's conscious or not, I know it's because he totally missed the note, the intonation and the texture of what it is to be Jewish. And uh, like you're saying, there's different levels. Like you can, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect or furnished just for you on every level. But if there's a total miss of that just inside, inside, I think that's the most important thing, as you said, regardless of what the source is. Like, if the source is not part of that world, they better have done the research. There you go. There's plenty of, of I will say, plenty of lesbian writers who get it um, in the same way that I have lesbian characters. But they're not the focus of my story because I don't know the inside of, uh, you know, and a lesbian's mind, quote, unquote, right, right. in capital letters. So, um, you know, I'm sympathetic. We experience the same issues, but at the heart of hearts, um, you know, I don't know if I would be able to write a lesbian love story because I don't know what it's like. Yeah, it, it, it's there's, a big, um, there's a big aspect of intuition and instinct, though, in anything it, it, that, that deals with imagination and creativity. I think Alan was kind of getting to this. Like, I guess where uh, the question, and I don't know if it's answerable, but I'd love to hear your comments, is where... Where does imagination, insight, and perspective leave off, and where does research 
began. I mean, because some people are just acutely insightful and they can craft mm-hmm. all kinds of characters and you get that human note and it works. But like, so what, what is your, uh, where, where are you on all of that? See, there's no hard line. And this kind of is the same argument because I've asked that same question. Uh, a lot of people talking about how when you're casting a movie, for example, and it's a gay character, it needs to be a gay actor. But right. that, by definition, would preclude gay actors getting straight roles. Right. So there has to be a certain level of, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with the ability of the actor at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So, so that's kind of a non-answer answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. And it's also, there's so many uh, unconscious issues of culture around it. Like Al Pacino has played, Tony Montana was Cuban, you know, he's a, and Pacino's Italian, and Pacino has played Jews, and Pacino, but he's part of the family. You accept him because there's such a, a dynamic insight and charisma. It's like, like, who else do you want? Like, why don't you go get a better actor if this is not good enough for you? So well, right. it, it, it depends on the artist. Over, right? He, he actually is capable of, you, you don't see Al Pacino, you see the character. That's you got it. Different. Yeah. Do you think there's a real che- every- cheapness now, but not only in books, because, I, you know, since the streaming days, now that we've got everything streamed and we have Netflix and Amazon and, and Tubi and all, you know, Shutter and everything, right? So with that, they have so many hours to fill. Do you think there's just a lot of generic scripting? Um, in in the writing as well, because, you know, we've got to have a gay character, we've got to have a gay couple, and we've got to have, you know, it seems like there's a lot of that stuff in every show that you you tune into now, and there's so many that they're trying to fill that there's just kind of a, I don't know, we just have some basic points, we stick it in there, and that just does the job. Alan, is it it clear to our guests that you're gay? (laughs) No. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Let's, I'd like to make that clear before the uh, temperature of the conversation goes in an unfortunate direction. I'm like, Go ahead. What? Please, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm completely aware. Um, okay. And it's interesting <laughs> you say that because I think there's always going to be an element of that, right? We've, we've got a role. We need an actor. And, and the reverse. Hey, we've got this, this project, and we need a big name attached to it. Um, therefore, if we put them in this slot – then, by God, it doesn't matter what the slot is. We'll get the money. We'll get it done. Right. Um, but with the wider and wider audience, I mean, there's always going to be more appetite for schlock, right? It, it's we need something in here, especially right now with the pandemic, everything. You know, productions have just been frozen. So they're, they're like looking in their backlog and saying, well, might as well produce this. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But I do think that because the audience is so much broader, it's the, the quality of a lot of things is coming along too. Um, there are gay and lesbian Christmas movies for God's sake. Mm, yeah. We were always comic relief before at best. And now it's actually focused on us from major studios. Yeah. But that's, I think my point is that um, without taking the seasonal or special, like, okay, it's a, it's a gay couple Christmas. Okay. It's something new and something that hasn't really been done. And they're, they're doing that. But it's um, every time I'm watching um, a series, and I do quite a few of these, uh, and you put it on, there's always going to be the stereotype characters. Not that I mind, but a lot of them I don't believe because they are that generic what you were trying to say, that it, you know they just fit that description and they make them – that character and it's kind of it's they don't interest me Hmm. i think if they were real you know what i'm saying i think if they were Uh if it was like a real um it was someone i could relate to someone i could say oh i know someone like that it's just not right no fair enough fair enough uh the the well i mean i guess we've moved into a place where we're the token 20 years ago um you know it would be african-americans uh, Asians have played in there as well. That's the token character that gets added to broaden the appeal. Um, I had a conversation kind of like this not long ago um, in another uh, interview where we were talking about the um, the ad, or gosh, I just completely lost my train of thought of what I was. There was a really great point I was making that is now. Um, uh, it was about a. Uh, side characters and uh, Asians have played in that space and it was black people and tokenism, anything? 
Yeah, and uh, it was it was an awesome point, and now it's gone. So uh, sorry. <laughs> well, what Austin <laughs> is, uh, I think a lot of what Alan is saying uh, is kind of tied up, and with TV, this is a little askew because it, it involves first person versus third person. Even in TV and movies, there's a, a sense, and a, a note of whether it's first or third person to an extent, like by virtue of which character you're following through the story. Um, I think in first person, for what it's worth, the, the syndrome of having marginal side characters becomes more of a liability because you're in the protagonist's mind and in their space. And if a side character comes on, maybe that character can, can be more of a token. So my, what I'm really curious about with your book, uh, uh, the one we're talking about today, but all of them in general, are you a first person guy or a third person guy? First person works better for me. Yeah. Um, from whatever reason. And it's, it's interesting because I, I was warned repeatedly, hey, you know, first person is really tough to carry off because at a certain mm. point, people get bored with what your character really thinks. That's really interesting. And I've heard the opposite. I heard, because uh, Norman Mailer was under the gun. I think he had to deliver the spooky art, his book about writing. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that because I love first person. Mailer said because he was under the gun, he had to be first person because it's just like sitting there and talking through your fingers. And I, I always felt it was more, uh, it was more automatic because we're, we're each an individuated unit. So to sit there and talk, even if it's through the, the voice of a character, just seems to, to gel for me. Hmm. Um, I find it difficult sometimes to change my mode of writing to fit what another character, how they think. Right. I right. know how my protagonist thinks. I understand the vast majority of what they do. Um, the other characters aren't always, and of course someone would argue if you don't understand what a character is doing, you shouldn't have that character. Fair right, enough. right. But um, I, I can't always switch that quickly to get that view. Um, I wrote one um, it, it kind of lengthy short story, I mean almost a pseudo novella, that it switched from character to character to character's point of view. And, um, you know, everyone hated it. They, they really said, um, even though I knew what each character was doing, because it was set essentially in my hometown, which is rural Oklahoma. And okay. We'll talk about that later. Um, it wasn't <laughs> concise enough to get that voice, to get that, you know, the, the operator in the, uh, the hair salon, to get the, the deputy sheriff to switch from those two seamlessly and have the voice clear enough that someone who'd never been to Podunk America could pick up on what the story was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's always a question of, of how much you inflected and accentuate and how much you use the language to telegraph the difference in voice versus letting it be subtle. All those things are very, very delicate. Absolutely. And I'm no Norman Mailer, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, what I'm curious about is before Al, before we got on, and Austin, I think you heard some of this. Al and I were talking about Al came under fire for content in his book uh, for a character that likes dressing up in women's clothing uh, and uh, happens to do violent things, as I understood it. And there was uh, political pushback in the sense that you know that paints a negative uh, picture, uh, perpetuates a negative stereotype of transvestites or uh, trans people. Um, which I know are two distinct uh, uh, categories. And I, I was asking Al, now I have you here to ask. Um, I read on Amazon the summary of your book, and isn't there an element of cross-dressing that, that I found that interesting? So there is. The, the basic storyline involves, again, a grand hotel that has um, decayed, is trying to be renovated. And my character, who's Horatio, um, goes by the name Rush, thus the Fool's Rush In title, okay. and oh. continues in the series. Um, he gets dragged into investigating the body that's found there. Um, the body has been there for decades. Uh, it's essentially mummified because it was walled up in um, what was one of the penthouse suites. And it becomes immediately avail or, uh, obvious. It's not a woman. Uh, it's actually a man dressed in, in hot couture, um, wig you know, the whole shebang, um, because he has a private investigator's license, because he's the son of a retired cop, because he's connected to several people in the, the gay community of uh, mm. 1990 San Diego. For a variety of reasons, he gets dragged in to help. And so he learns a lot about the history of drag uh, back in the early 70s in San Diego. Um, oh, nice. Including... Okay. Yeah, so that, that's really the, 
um, the, the the pull and why it's actually about drag. It's not necessarily it's about, drag. about right about transvestitism. It's um, right. I, I, and I can't say a lot more without giving away some important things. But one of the main characters is in fact transgender. Oh, I see. And is the, and I would assume based on other things you've said that the drag history that's incorporated is probably accurate. It's it's like a form of uh, journalism built into your work of fiction. It is, um, of course, the, the, the actual characters themselves and some of the circumstances they find themselves in are fictionalized, but it is based on how things progressed in San Diego in the late 60s and early 70s. Got it. What, what made you go this way? <clears throat> like, what made you write this story, this particular idea? So it really came from, uh, again, quite seriously, uh, I lived in downtown San Diego uh, back in the early 90s, and the hotel that inspired it, the El Cortez, um, was in danger of being renovated uh, because they wanted to take away some of the newer aspects like the 50s neon and the, uh, the sky. Um, you know, a lot of things that were done in the 50s when it was the, a very stylish place to be. And again, it just kept, I, I wondered if they ever got around, which they have now. They're luxury condos. You know, they're, they're a great building. Um, what would they find? And, and if, if they found a body, why would it be there? Mm, yeah. And the building had literally been abandoned for decades. I mean, it was, um, you know, a homeless shelter at one point, a uh, drug rehab center at one point. It, uh, but most of the time I was there, it was literally boarded up. Um, and so if, if, you, if you put that together with what could be there and how could someone be there, well, you take something terribly glamorous and faded, that's drag. There you go. Mm, yeah. Oh. So there, it's, it's sort of like a, a textual influence in the sense that's the essence of drag. In my opinion, it, the best drag, yeah, absolutely. I mean, drag has this renaissance now where it is a, uh, it's avant-garde. It, it is the, you know, the, the cutting edge of fashion. Uh, and drag wasn't always that way. Drag was a, a safe place for, um, you know, for queens to, to do their shtick. But it was never, I, with the exception of acceptable drag like Milton Berle. Right. Um, there, you know, drag always had that seedy quality to it that made it um, very exciting and tempting, but not something that you would talk about openly. Right. I was going to say uh, trashy, but I didn't want to den denigrate it. And I, I would have meant that as a compliment. I mean, that's part of oh, what exactly. makes it countercultural yeah. and, and uh, gives it human juice. Um, yes. Yeah. The divine yeah. aspect, literally. Yeah. John um, Waters' um, sensibility. Right. Right. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Oh, I thought you meant divinity, uh, like uh, spiritually. Totally understand. Yeah. Uh, and then also, um, there's you know, there's uh, an excitement to drag, uh, or you know, uh, quote unquote cross dressing. There's a, a, a primal excitement and a visceral excitement that comes with it. So if you quote unquote class it up too much, you could, could sort of sanitize it and undercut that. Yes, yes. Um, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, like RuPaul ha is, is, let's face it, she's responsible for the, this renaissance in drag and, and bringing it into uh, mm. a standard. At the same time, there's nothing trashy about RuPaul. Um, right, right. She's all American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very acceptable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a funny thing, and that's, you know, I, I've had several conversations with, with other authors and other, um, you know, folks in my age range. So, you know, gay culture, uh, while it is absolutely mainstream here, of course, we, we always face, you know, what we face. Um, but by the, the – and what we fought for was to be accepted and to be essentially mainstream. But I don't think we anticipated the fact that gay culture is now disappearing, Gay bars, gay bookstores. Um, oh, the, the, the authentic, the, the, the vintage end of it. If you think of it in those terms, yeah, the, the yeah. things that, you know, the, uh, the, I don't want to be like too cliche with like the secret language of hankies, but, um, right. <laughs> you know, that thing that we understood that other folks didn't, um, that made us, you know, a community, a subculture. You know, kids today don't, those kids, Darn kids today. Listen to me. Um, <laughs> kids. You know, <laughs> get off my lawn. Um, they don't, um, you know, it, it's not important to them. 
they happen to be gay and they're with their straight friends or, you know, they don't express a gender because it's not important to them because they have that freedom to do it, which is what we wanted all along. But we also didn't stop to think, you know, what does that, what does that do? I mean, if, if bars like Stonewall are in danger of closing uh, yeah. in a different light bookstore, you know, yeah. what are you left with? Yeah, the the exclusivity, the uh, the idea that, you know, back in I I mean I'm I'm older and so, in in my day you had to go through the worst neighborhood to get to the one one gay bar that was, you know, down a set of stairs on a dark alley, mm. right? Um, and so, you know, it's come from, but there was something special about the community that we had that I don't think they have anymore. Um, I think it's, it's a all lot more by Budweiser yeah. and Nathan. <laughs> yeah, and it's more blended. It's more blended. Like, and when you're up at, like, I've been up in Canada here, and um, it's just now all mixed in because it's been yeah. legal twenty years, even longer than than the U.S. So it's even more blended. It's just gone to there is no differences anymore. Uh, <laughs> you don't you don't have a gay bar per se to go to. Yeah. 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 You know, so it's different. Um, but, you know, you know, it's good. It's good. It's good that you write something like this because I think that the younger people, those darn kids on your lawn, have something <laughs> to read then, right? Like they have something to kind of establish what was going on just, just in a short time ago. Yeah. And we certainly don't want to go back there. I don't think anyone wants that. I, I think it's just the, you know, the knowledge of it's always good to know your roots because mm. – if you don't know where we've been, again, it's kind of like that, um, you know, if, if you take out history and social studies and civics classes, uh, courtesy of, you know, No Child Left Behind, what do you wind up with? Um, folks that don't really understand how important it is that, you know, the voices be heard and the laws be kept and you fall back in danger of, of being back in those places. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting how uh, assimilation is a double-edged sword because it's, the, like you said, the positive thing that's uh, being pursued over time, but it, uh, it, robs, uh, it robs the novelty from the, uh, the heart of the pursuit. It can. It can. Yeah. I think what it is is that, you know, it's something that, you know, something um, I'll miss certain things. You go through the fight at your time really for the next generation. You just want them to be aware of it. They they don't. They're, they're going to live a better life by being mainstream now than than let's say I did when I was twenty years old, and and it was all secret, you know. Um, but I, you know, I just think that yeah, they should be aware of it. And it's that with that being said, the characters in your book do you, do you get them from people that you've actually known? <laughs> uh, yes and no. So there are several key characters that are uh, based on either one or multiple people that I know or um, know of. Uh, there's no, you know, one-to-one -one relationship for any of them, but many of them were manufactured to serve their role in the plot. Um, but I did try to keep them in the vein of um, what was it like in the early 90s to either be out, uh, more notably, to, yeah. especially in the next two books, to not be out, um, but to know that you're, uh, you know, that you're quite different from everyone, and how, how are you going to cope with that? Um, yeah. It's, uh, you know, there are people larger than life that, that I, I've been very fortunate in my life to know some in, incredible people over the years, and some of them deserve their own books. But, um, you know, it's, this is, um, it's, it's how you write a mystery, right? Is you, you figure out the puzzle and then you, you try to plan how could someone decrypt it in a reasonable, believable way. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of locker room puzzles, um, you know, where at the end it happens, someone parachuted in, you know, through some like very secret, you know, th those, those cheater kind of, of solutions that that's not that doesn't interest me that much 
but real human emotions. Um, we all do things we don't expect to do. We all disappoint ourselves. We all, um, we, I, but I do think we all try to do the right thing. But you put, you know, 10 people in a room and you're going to have 12 outcomes. There, there's just an unpredictability about human nature that I find very fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, because uh, I'm a huge uh, story structure geek. Uh, I'm real curious because I've never written a mystery. Um, and I just edited one for a client in the past couple of weeks, which was a cozy. And I was, I was puzzling over the, uh, and puzzle being a good word, like over the structure in terms of it seems like um, in its most unadorned form, the thing that keeps the engine of a mystery going is to spread suspicion around. Um, if it's hinged on a murder, then, you know, to, there's enough uh, ongoing tension in terms of questioning people's motives or behavior. Uh, but you've used the word puzzle repeatedly. I'm wondering, I, I just uh, I want some comments about how elaborate the mystery gets as you weave it. That, okay, that, that was really one of my major stumbling blocks in writing a believable story. Uh, my original draft of it was much more convoluted in getting to the the actual villain. And I realized early on that it wasn't fun. Reading it became a an IQ test as opposed to enjoying getting there. Right. And I, and I just backed away from that. So I told the story that I wanted to tell. And if it's obvious who the murderer is, I'm actually okay with that because there's a lot more to the story than that. And over the next two installments in this series, um, it all adds up to a greater puzzle that this is just really the, the entry to it. Um, my real interest in this was, uh, which surprised me, was watching my protagonist um, expand and sort of evolve. Um, he, he doesn't really understand a lot about how he wound up where he is in the first place, and he he, he will never admit this, but he feels kind of helpless. Um, he's just sort of wound up where he is. He owns a bar. He doesn't know how to run a bar. He never wanted to run a bar, <laughs> but it's all he's got at this point. Uh, so he's got to figure out a way to make it work. And falling into uh, having to solve a mystery on top of it is about more than he can handle. But by the end of this particular story, he finds out that He's not alone in the world. He's much more capable than he thought. And he doesn't really have to live under the shadow of his dad and his grandfather, as he always has. So in a lot of ways, this is really more about the protagonist than it is about the mystery. Yeah, I think that's a good call in the sense you said earlier, um, I think that, you know, the emotion is where it's at. And I believe that's true for any story. So I think that's a good call because uh if you get into that info dumping of a really over elaborate mystery, that's just going to leave people cold. I mean, there might be a certain type of mindset that likes it and likes the strictly analytical dimension of it. But I think uh, if you lose that emotional connection, you're just, you're stranded. It's almost the, uh, I don't know if you're, you probably read Lord Peter Whimsey. Um, that is all about the puzzle. Yes. Okay. He's a charming mm -hmm. English vintage detective, Dorothy Sayers. I mean, uh, okay. very much in the Agatha Christie contemporary and extremely capable. She put so much energy, though, into creating uh, and reusing the same character that then each installment of it, not really novel length, but our you know, uh, maxi short stories, if you want to think of it that way, um, she could just focus on the puzzle itself because yeah. Lord Peter himself was already established. You didn't really have to do anything. Right, um, right. So, yeah, she's a, a fantastic author and fun to read, but, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a Rubik's Cube every time. Yeah, it's interesting because that that's, ties to something else I'm curious about, uh, always with all writers, um, is how many drafts you do. And I feel that there are certain writers, and, and I'll say this before you answer, that do, like, dozens of drafts, and it's almost like they're trying to impersonate, like, uh, like, like a, they're like a human octopus, like they're trying to be eight people at once. To, to keep, you know, quintupling down, et cetera, on their own power as an author. But I think at a certain point, once you lose the spontaneity and spark and instinct, there's the uh, the risk of it not being as human. So when you describe that author you were just talking about, I'm like, yeah, that's great to meticulously assemble your Rubik's Cube, 
But yeah, I, I, on the other hand, just like I value emotion, I value spontaneity. So I'm curious, with a mystery, you as a mystery writer, it being understood that the mystery wasn't your first priority uh, to drive the story, like how many drafts were you doing? So um, it, I learned writing this, by the way, that the mystery wasn't my goal. Got it. Uh, okay. That's what, what I got out of this. So that was huge for me. It, I had essentially written the book um, you know, in fits and starts over a couple of years with that first draft, the one that then became really about the, the puzzle. I basically discarded that entirely. Oh, I see. Um, the way that I've learned that I write is that I, I, I sit down with an outline. So I understand the overall structure, but it's not a very tight outline. It's just, um, you know, I don't even think of it as chapters more as phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, because I know where I need to go. And then as I think through the overall storyline, vignettes appear in my mind and I play the characters against each other and they do what those characters do. Once I can actually see that scene in my head, I can write it. And I typically write that part pretty quickly because now I, I know where I'm going, I know what they're saying, I know how they're going to react to each other. It's not in series. It's more often than not completely out of order. Mm. Um, and then I do the editing work is really knitting them together and making sure that I don't have any false starts or I've lost a thread or, you know, someone's dead before they <laughs> need to be dead. <laughs> right. uh, that was one of the problems with, with the first book is a character I really, really wanted to kill um, turned out to be too useful, so she's coming back. So. Uh, oh, got you. <laughs> wow. Well, did you have an underlying theme in the story, something that is not part of uh, the mystery itself or part of necessarily the character? But So so someone reads Fool's Rush In. At the end of it, is there something that they um, you want them to get? So I'll answer that story with an example. I think it was in seventh grade English where uh, we read a, uh, a Jack London short story. And the, the teacher, who otherwise a wonderful teacher, you know, it was a basic story about irony. She tried to make the apples that fell from the uh, horse's saddle from the one soldier that got killed a symbol of life lost. And I thought, that's the biggest load of crap I've ever heard. Uh, Jack London wrote for whiskey money at that time, right? That was his focus. <laughs> he was writing a story about the inequities of war. He wasn't weaving symbolism into it. If he did, he did it unconsciously. Again, my humble opinion. I don't write with a theme in mind. Um, there may be one there. Someone may find one, and they may be convinced there's one. There wasn't one written into it. Mm. So the, the voices I get in my head, you didn't send them to me. <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> Don't rule anything out. Enter, yeah. enter the secret code, and we'll find out. Well, <laughs> there, you, there you go. Yeah, Al, I told you to put the tinfoil on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had to cook something for <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you... You've had that vaccine, I can tell. Yeah. Several times. I got well, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah, don't hoax. overdo the vaccine. It's a hoax. Yeah. It's not, it's not real. <laughs> he got Come the on. vaccine, then he got sick. Yeah. 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 I got the flu. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering, um, so where do you want to go with this? I said, you know, because it came into your life and now it seems to be uh, off, up and running. Um so where do you see this going? Do you see this as like something you're going to do for a long time? Uh, or is this kind of um, just do a couple and then run? Or wh wh where do you see it? it that's, that's a fantastic question. I wish I, I, wish I knew. Um, I kind of thought it would be a one-off. A, hey, I've proved to myself I can do this. I've always wanted to do this. I always thought I could do this, et cetera. Um, I, I was shocked when other people told me I can do this. Um, I don't see this as my main source of income because, you know, the return on investment is horrible, <laughs> let's face it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it, 
um, interacting with people who've read it and enjoy it or um, who don't enjoy it. Some of those are, are just as, as, you know, educating. Um, I really find this to be something that maybe I should have done this much earlier and maybe mm. this is something that I should have focused on. Um, you know, I, I'm not close to retirement, unfortunately, but I could see this being uh, something that takes the place of retirement. I, I would really enjoy that. There's, I already have a second series mapped out, completely different character. Um, it's, uh, I will say though, the pandemic has, has and I, I was really, I hate to say excited about things like lockdown because I really thought, wow, I can, I can get the, uh, the other series will be the protagonist is Wally Walker. I, I can really get Wally up and going. Um, it It's just sapped my creative energy. I did quite the reverse of what I expected. Yeah. Mm. No, and I relate. I, I agree with you totally. And I ask almost every author that I have on how this, how this has affected them. Just this whole year between the pandemic, between, uh, you know, Dingle Nuts Trump and, uh, and, and all the things going on. There's so much tension. Um, yes. Can you still write? And, and, and most people, you know, it's weird because most people say, yeah, sure. In fact, I, I'm doing better. And, and I'm thinking, oh, then I'm insane because I, I'm having some terrible days here. <laughs> Huge distraction. Yeah. Those I, are, I, are not people that I could probably have to dinner without. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just, it just, it kind of shocks me because even, even at times I'll say, well, do, do, it, doesn't this seep into your writing? So if you're still writing during these, you know, weird times, couldn't it affect your writing? And, and again, most say no, uh, it doesn't. And I, I, I guess I'm too attached to my surroundings, and and I'm yeah. too emotional in the sense that uh, happiness can just, you know, just pop like a balloon, real easy for me. It, it's only a, a second. Yeah, it's your it's your surroundings, and it's also the outlook. It's like, wait, where is everything going? Where, like, what what is culture anymore? Like, what are we all going to be thinking? So it's it's hard to create something that's intended for mass culture under such unstable circumstances. I think that's entirely fair. Uh, when you use the term tension, that that is exactly the word that I've been using the past year specifically, and really the past, uh, you know two, three years, it, it's just been amping up gradually. And as hopelessness, despair, you know, when you, you see the, the pandemic continuing and you continue to see people doing things that will continue the pandemic as opposed to stopping it, you do get a sense of why am I even, why do I care? Why should I try? Um, because I do, I, I, I like writing, I write for myself, but I really enjoy other people um, reading it. That, that's part of the whole experience for me. And knowing that, you know, there are a lot of idiots out there kind of uh, just really make you like, well, why do you want to do that? But yeah. sincerely, since February, it has been like a distant but increasingly close rake on a chalkboard. Yeah. Um, amping up and up and up. Um, I, it's something I inherited from my father. I, I'm just inherently a storyteller. Um, what I do professionally is, is an aspect of that. Um, and when, you know, frustrated in that, I find that my writing becomes much more prolific and much better. Um, so some of that energy is siphoned off with what I do professionally versus this. But both over the past, specific, you know, six months, um, to, to a new height, uh, it, it's a grind instead of being enjoyable. Yeah. So, what, do you, um, what do you do professionally? He's a stripper. So, um, <laughs> I, I well, that's, for that's only on weekends. Um, <laughs> the, the work week. Uh, no, I, I demonstrate software. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, so there's a storytelling component. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's not like, like teaching or actually storytelling, but it's, it's to be a successful uh, demo dolly. Um, you tell a story. You make people believe that this software is going to make their lives better. Um, that's the successful. The technical part is irrelevant, but convincing them that this is a good thing um, is, is core to it. I mean, my most important, for what I do professionally, uh, the education for me that was most important was drama club, um, you know, yeah. uh, and I hate to say it, but show choir. 
<laughs> yes, I'm a show choir survivor. There you go. Well, <laughs> it sounds like it paid paid off. It, it's weird, right, to be uh, that you know, uh, senior year, first semester debate is one of the most useful things I have in my job. <laughs> um, good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you have a website now? Let's let's get. So, uh, how do you want people to find you, stalk you? Um, <laughs> oh, they're want. welcome to however, however they can try. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the I have a page on Facebook. Have a page on Goodreads. Have a pa- uh, have a web page page. Um, more than anything else, I'd like to hear from people about um, what you know what resonated for them. I, I got one review where someone who uh, used to live in San Diego and said, "I know exactly where you're talking about." That was everything to me. Oh, nice. Uh, that that's like the ultimate compliment is that they recognize because uh, I used to live in Ocean Beach, and sure enough, that's they were like, "Boom, that's where it is." Reviews matter? Um, reviews, constructive reviews matter. Um, I've had many reviews that were, the romance sucked. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. You know, you <laughs> for romance. I don't write for romance, so that, that doesn't bother me. If someone on the other hand said, you know, the mystery was stupid and the characters are flat and the setting was, was cardboard, I would want to hear from them to understand, geez, did you read the right book? Is that really mine? <laughs> um, that's what I pride myself on. So. Mm. Yeah. Well, so it, it, so someone else, now that you're gone through this uh, initial um, publishing and, and getting a book out and everything, a couple out now, um, what would be your advice to someone that's just writing now that's never never done it? Number one, and this is trite but true, read. Read everything you can in the genre you want to write because if nothing else, it'll tell you, it'll give you some great examples to model on and it'll show you some terrible examples to, to say, hey, you can do better than that. Okay? Number two, reach out to authors you like. Don't be afraid. Um, I've had great experiences with communicating with authors that I respect and like. Um, beta reading for uh, them has become a huge thing for me. Um, you know, that, that confidence to say, wow, um, you know, they're not uh, on this, this, you know, high mountain up here. They're looking for the same sort of stuff I am. And, you know, especially when you get some that value your input and that's, it's a huge, it's a huge ego stroke that you, you might need to push your work out and say, Hey world, what do you think? Hmm. Yeah. Have you had that imposter syndrome yet happen? Imposter syndrome. Well, you know, where you you put it out and you feel like uh, you feel like you're not really that good. You know, people, you know, you're a writer, but not really. It's it's you're going to be found out or that sort of a syndrome. Well, I can say it's so incredibly surreal. Uh I never believed that, um, like, okay, and I guess there's a difference for me between writer and author. I always knew that I could write. I never thought I'd be an author. Um, So I I don't really refer to myself as an author yet. I'm not there because I I do get what you're saying. Um, Someone else called me an author, and it it was like um, a bell tone in my head. Um, (laughs) Like, Okay. <laughs> and I have to say, when, when I got the first physical copies, that it wasn't even opening the box. It was putting it on a bookshelf that really um, hit me upside the head. That's when it was real. Wow. So, uh, yeah, impo- uh, that, that's an interesting term. It's yeah. always been surreal for me. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm still waiting to believe it, I guess. Yeah, and that's kind of, you know, that's a good place to be, actually. Because when it's no longer that, I think it, it becomes different. You know what I mean? It no longer mm. special. Um, yeah. You know, uh, for, yeah, for me. Uh, I, I That's completely right. This, this entire thing for me has been so much fun. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work involved, but it's not like, uh, it, how do I put this when I, 
<laughs> I actually said this to a friend of mine who who was an editor herself uh, in a completely different uh, vertical, but um, I said, you know, when when I see that that thirty seven dollars from Amazon deposit, it's more important to me than the um, my paycheck actually, <laughs> even though it pays the mortgage, right? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you keep yeah. it up, and it won't be long, and it'll be paying your mortgage. I, well, you be, you might be. You'd be surprised because I never thought I'd, I'd uh, do good enough in a book, and I and I'm and I, I'm a terrible writer. And, <laughs> and I'll be the first to tell you I don't know what no, I'm no. doing, but I've I've done really well with it uh, for the last couple of books. So, you know what? Um, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah, I'll <laughs> I, I'll just uh, I'll just celebrate it as ninety eighth birthday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm doing it's just, well. Uh, it's your 62nd and 63rd book now. No, that's true. Now, first of all, you're not a bad writer. What are you talking about? And second of all, uh, yeah, you are good. I mean, you're paying the mortgage with it. So, uh, uh, you know, so uh, that's a good uh, inspiration. Yeah. It, 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 it's just all it takes is one thing to happen. It's the weirdest thing because it comes out of the blue and all of a sudden um, you've got a hit and you don't know why. <laughs> and, and and it's weird, you know. Uh, you're seeing thousands of books go out, and it's kind of like, really? Boy, there's a lot of dumb people out there. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 know, you cut that part out of the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know go back down to hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> They'll expect yeah. me to it, keep that in there. That's just yeah. Yeah. It's part but, of the brand. What what I didn't get was people in Japan and Australia, and uh, where was the weirdest one? I want to say it was the Czech Republic. I'm like, how did you know about my book? How did you read it? I, I want to get a hold of them and say, yeah. what did you think? That's awesome. Because yeah. I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing. Um, it's all good. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Um, the newest book is Fools Rush In. Our guest has been Austin Thomas Burton. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. Perfect. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. Awesome. You know. um, you're about to jump on another call, aren't you, Al? Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got another. God damn. Uh, actually, um, this one will be good, too. C.S. Pole, Carol Pole. Pole. Oh, hello, I oh, said cool. hi. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Nice girl. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks a bunch. Happy I really birthday. appreciate it. Yo, yeah, and I appreciate <laughs> it, too. Uh, I'll send you an email on Friday. It'll have all the links and where you can download all that sort of good stuff. Excellent, because the audiobook should be coming out in the next couple of days, so um, perfect timing. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.